Hope everybody had a good weekend. I hope. So I had a nice weekend. I went to the coast and got away, so which is why I didn't get the video posted until uh, Sunday. So I know there were several of you who were very anxious to see that, so I'm sorry it took a few minutes. Uh, there was actually a problem on the OSU uh, site on Friday, so I couldn't get the thing uh, done on Friday afternoon, which is what I prefer to do. So that's why I waited until yesterday. Um, I have not yet uh, uh, officially uh, announced a time for the uh, BB450 review session for exam two. Um, I am planning on that being tomorrow night at 5 p.m. Um, and and I will videotape as before, uh, and I will announce that for sure when I get a room secured. I haven't done that yet, so I need to uh, do that. But I'll send an email out uh, to the class listserv. I'll also post the information for it on the class webpage. Material for exam two will go through whatever I covered today. Okay? So today is the end of material for exam two. Clear mud? Okay, so we're just about done talking about metabolic control, and this last thing I'm going to talk about is sort of an add-on in the chapter. It's kind of like your um, authors of the textbook weren't quite sure where to put this one, so they stuck it here under metabolic control. Um, this refers to the reaction types uh, that enzymes catalyze, and it's actually a fairly interesting uh, 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 set of information. Uh, the reaction types... Um, are shown down here, and this categorization of the, rea of the reactions that enzymes catalyze is a, um, an attempt to systematize the um, classification of enzymes, making them systematic. Okay? Uh, there are, it turns out, six separate categories of reactions that are catalyzed by enzymes. So we can take all the reactions that are catalyzed by enzymes and we can, we can place them into six groups based on the chemical reaction being catalyzed. Okay? They're shown on the screen. All right? So, uh, and I'll give you examples or show you some examples of these, but the six different types are oxidation reduction, ligation requiring ATP cleavage, isomerization, group transfer, hydrolytic and addition or removal of functional groups. Now, let me show you some examples of uh, these types of reactions. Oxidation, rea oxidation reduction reactions I talked about last time, and they involve loss of electrons by one substance and gain of the electrons by another substance. In this case, the top case we see succinate, which we will study next term in learning about the citric acid cycle. We see succinate losing electrons to FAD, meaning succinate is becoming oxidized, FAD is becoming reduced, and the products of those that reaction is fumarate plus FADH2. Whenever you see an electron carrier in a reaction, okay, you can pretty much assume it's a redox reaction because the electron carrier is there to carry electrons. Here's another reaction we'll talk about next term, malate going to exaloacetate. Malate has, has the electrons that it loses, gives electrons to NAD to make NADH, and exaloacetate is a product. So oxidation reduction reactions are very easy to spot, uh, largely because of the involvement of the electron carriers. Ligation reactions are also fairly uh, easy to understand. Ligation reactions generally involve the joining together of two different molecules. Okay? The joining together of two different molecules. So we can see in this case pyruvate is being joined to carbon dioxide. We'll talk about this reaction uh, in about a week or so. And in this reaction, carbon dioxide is joined to a three-carbon pyruvate to make a four-carbon molecule exaloacetate. So joining two substances together is what is involved in ligation reactions. OK. Um, isomerization reactions are also very easy to uh, recognize. We're changing the configuration of a molecule. We're not causing oxidation or reduction or breakage or ligation or any of that. We're simply rearranging it. In this case, citrate, we can see here, is being converted to isocitrate. And basically, this hydroxyl group is moving from here over to here, swapping places with a hydrogen. So a rearrangement reaction is an isomerization. You'll also notice that the reaction types that I give here are slightly different than the ones that were in the table. It's jumping around. 
Uh, slightly different than the ones I gave in the table, I would prefer that you use my categoriza categorizations than the one that's in that table. Group transfer. Uh, group transfer uh, may not sound very intuitive by its name, but it basically involves the movement of a portion of one molecule to another molecule. Notice I said a portion of one molecule to another molecule. A ligation joins two molecules. A group transfer transfers a portion of one to another. In this reaction, which we'll talk about later today, glucose is gaining a phosphate from ATP. That gives it glucose 6-phosphate and leaves behind ADP. So this is a prime example of a group transfer uh, type reaction, the phosphate being the group that's being transferred. Hydrolytic reactions, uh, as their name implies, you've already seen a bunch of these, are reactions that involve cleavage of a molecule using water. So the proteases, for example, that we talked about used water to break peptide bonds, and they are example of hydrolytic uh, reactions. You see a prime one on the uh, screen right there. The last one is probably the hardest to understand, and to be honest with you, I don't place much emphasis on it, but I'll just give you um, a, a notion of what it is. Uh, the last group is called lyases, and lyases are enzymes that basically catalyze the splitting of a molecule. That's a little bit simplification of what they do. But you can see in this reaction from glycolysis that fructose 1,6-bisphosphate is being split in half. And so lyases cause the breakage of bonds to split molecules into two. That's one way of thinking at them. And for our purposes, that's all we really need to uh, pay attention to. I'm not going to expect you to memorize the names of these enzymes. But I do think that you should know the categories, the six categories. Okay? So I'm not going to say, well, what, give me an example of an enzyme that is a lyase, for example. I think that's just uh, busy work. But understanding the six categories is useful. Now, the six categories actually, as I said, are an attempt to systematize the naming of enzymes. And this gave rise to what was called the EC number. Okay? The EC number, EC stands for Enzyme Commission. And they were the group that came up with these categories. And they are involved in classifying enzymes into each of the six different categories. So when we see, for example, um, an enzyme that is a, um, an oxidoreductase, okay, it would all fit into a category like this. And it would have a specific EC number. So the EC number, and I, I don't remember the numbers off the top of my head, but I think this is, is category one. All oxidoreductases would have in their numbering scheme that, that corresponds to them the very first digit corresponding to the category that they're in. So in this case, an oxidoreductase is category one. All of the uh, enzymes in the EC commission that are oxidoreductase would have as their first number, number one. They would have a one point something, point something, point something, point something, that each point would designate a little bit more specificity about the type of reaction that the enzyme catal uh, catalyzes. Okay. But six general groups, and that first digit of the EC number is what is critical for identifying these six groups. Yes, sir? Do the EC numbers correspond to the order you gave those to us? I, you know, I don't know if they correspond to the order, to be honest with you. So I, I'm not worried about you memorizing those numbers. But know that there are six. OK. Um, blah. OK. Um, that's basically what I want to say. I'll just show you this last thing as a trivia item. It's not something I expect you to memorize or anything, but it shows the sort of central importance of the molecule ADP in a variety of places as it appears in biochemistry. ADP is, of course, a part of ATP. The ADP is shown in blue, red, and yellow. Okay? That same ADP is found in NADH. It's found in NADPH, which is not shown on here. It's found in FAD. And it's also found in uh, coenzyme A. All right? I don't know why it's not red over here, but uh, it's also found in coenzyme A. You don't need to know that. I'm just showing you that for trivial, for trivial purposes. Um, but these molecules play very, very important roles uh, inside of cells. And ADP is a significant component of every one of them. OK, so much for metabolic controls. Um, we're going to turn our attention now for the first time to the uh, pathways of metabolism. So metabolism I'm going to define for you as a collection, 
of reactions okay, that are found in cells. Metabolism we can think of as the chemical reactions or the biochemical reactions going on inside of cells. As I showed you on the roadmap the other day, these molecules or these reactions are actually linked into highway-like um, uh, pathways that one molecule leads to another, leads to another, leads to another. And as such, that means that all of metabolism in a given cell is linked. There's no escaping that. They're all linked. Now, I want to emphasize to you that a given pathway, we're going to be talking about glycolysis, a given pathway is a man-made invention. It's a man-made invention, but it's there, it's on the table. Well, that's right, but where I call it glycolysis really depends upon where I define the starting point and the ending point. If we look at that big road map, it's kind of like saying, where is the road to Portland, right? The road to Portland could start in uh, Ashland, if we're thinking about Southern Oregon, it could start in Salem, it could start in Seattle, okay? So where we define a given roadway is really a man-made invention. And so glycolysis is like that. For our purposes, glycolysis will be a pathway that starts with glucose and ends at pyruvate. Okay? Starts at glucose and ends at pyruvate. You'll see as we get going further into that 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 is a bit of an arbitrary thing. I also want you to keep in mind that when we talk about metabolism, when we talk about these pathways, that the pathways are interconnected. They're interconnected. I could take the road to Portland by going, for example, over to I-5, riding it up to Salem, and then cutting over to, say, 99, and then going back up. There's a lot of ways I could take that pathway to Portland, and the metabolic pathways are the same way. Now, the significance for us of the interconnectedness of pathways is the interconnectedness of the molecules in those pathways. We can't say that this molecule is in glycolysis, okay? Because A, glycolysis is a man-made invention, and B, that molecule might be part of what we define as glycolysis, but now if I think of the pathways going out instead of up and down, that molecule might be tied to other things as well. So there's a very, very strong interconnectedness with that. You'll see that especially next term when I start talking about the citric acid cycle and fatty acid oxidation. Okay, well let's take an overview of the pathway of glycolysis. The pathway of glycolysis starts with glucose. Glucose is the most common and most abundant sugar on the face of the earth. It has six carbons. The pathway of glycolysis causes it to be broken into two pieces that are identical, known as pyruvate. So one six carbon piece gives rise to two three carbon pieces. And then at pyruvate, we see that pyruvate has three different fates, as we describe them. Meaning pyruvate can be converted into three different things depending upon what the cell needs, what the cell has, and the type of cell in which the reaction is occurring. What the cell needs, what the cell has, and the type of reaction in which this reaction is occurring. So let's just very briefly go through these. I'll probably remind you of them later when I get to pyruvate uh, talking about the pathway. Pyruvate, most commonly, when we're talking about aerobic metabolism, goes to acetyl-CoA. And it's not even shown on here, but acetyl-CoA is an intermediate. Acetyl-CoA plus oxygen ultimately leads to carbon dioxide plus water. So the first and most common direction is to go where oxygen is available, and it goes to acetyl-CoA. We'll see how that acetyl-CoA gets used next term. But this pathway, this very first and most important pathway, requires oxygen. Okay? Well, what if cells don't have oxygen? All right? If cells don't have oxygen, and yes, that does occur in our bodies when we're exercising heavily, our muscles can't get oxygen fast enough, they have to have a backup way of generating energy, as we shall see. In our cells, when they're lacking oxygen, pyruvate gets converted to lactate. Notice again, lactate is not the same as lactose. Lactose is a sugar. Lactate is this guy over here. Well, what if it's not my cells? What if it is a bacterial cell or a yeast cell? Well, and it runs out of oxygen. That, of course, that pathway goes from pyruvate and leads us to ethanol. 
It's the foundation of brewing, microbrewing, and all these great things that happen with that. For any of you who've ever done, made your own beer and so forth, you know that you mix all the stuff up and then you cap it off so that there's no oxygen available. And that lack of oxygen is what leads to the production of ethanol. And we'll see later why that's the case. So three different fates for pyruvate. No oxygen leads to either, either ethanol in the case of bacteria and yeast or lactate in the case of, of us. And in any organism that is aerobic, when there's oxygen available, it goes to acetyl-CoA. Questions on that? Hearing none? Okay. Let's dive into glycolysis. This figure is a fairly good overview of the process of glycolysis. It has all the players on it. You can see glucose, glucose 6-phosphate, blah, blah, blah. The first question I get is, well, what of this do we have to know? All right. Well, I'm going to spell that out for you fairly explicitly right here. All right. First of all, you need to know the names of the 10 intermediates. Okay. Second of all, you need to know the names of anything that you could easily learn. What does that mean? Well, I've told you previously that you need to know the structure of glucose, and glucose is right there. Duh, right? You also had to know the structure. If you know the structure of glucose, then learning the structure of glucose 6 phosphate means you simply need to know the where to put the phosphate onto there. Duh. You also had to know the structure of fructose and Fructose, if you put a phosphate on it, you have fructose 6 phosphate right there, so that's an easy one. Fructose 1, 6 bisphosphate. Fructose, you put a phosphate on positions 1 and 6, and you've got that guy there. Okay? So those four, given the fact that you already know glucose, or already you're supposed to know glucose and fructose, should be no brainers for you. Okay? Now, I will mention other ones depending upon how far I get through the, the, this um, pathway today in the lecture that you'll be responsible for, and I'll save those to see how far along that I get. Okay, now, this overview of the pathway, we can also see in blue over here the names of the enzymes. The enzyme names you are responsible for. Yes, these are very important enzymes in the body. And the enzyme names actually tell you something about what's going on in the reaction. Okay? Here's hexokinase. Hexo meaning six. Kinase meaning puts a phosphate onto. This guy puts a phosphate onto six carbon sugars. And guess what? Glucose is a six carbon sugar. So hexokinase puts a phosphate onto glucose. Okay? So the 10 names of the, of the intermediates, the 10 names of the enzymes, and the molecules that it's easy to learn the structure of. And I'll, I'll point out two more for you. OK. Well, let's look at this process. We see that the process is divided on your screen into two main phases. And those two main phases are actually different than, the, than what the last version of your book did. If you have the sixth edition of the book, you will see it splits it into three phases. And I was never very fond of the three phases, so I'm glad they went to this two-phase model. The two phases are known as energy investment and energy realization, or energy generation. You can call it whatever you want. It means that in the first phase of glycolysis, we have to put energy into the molecules. And in the second phase of glycolysis, we get more energy out than we put in. Now, I want to emphasize that glycolysis is a source of ATP in the cell. It is not usually a very large one. Only when cells are hurting does glycolysis become a very large one. When are cells hurting? One of the times might be if they're low on oxygen. Then that ATP that they can get from glycolysis turns out to be very, very important. Okay. I'll also give you a, a, some numbers here that we will talk about probably more again next term than this term. But this gives you an idea of the importance or the relative importance of glycolysis in the scheme of things. If I start with glucose and I go down to pyruvate, what you will discover is I produce a net gain of two ATPs. 
two ATPs. That's not a lot. But I also generate some other things along the way that are very useful. I pr produce, first of all, some NADH. I produce two of those. And I also produce two pyruvates. Now, if I take these NADHs and I take those pyruvates and I oxidize them all the way down, this happens in the citric acid cycle and the electron transport system. If I oxidize them all the way down and I count the number of ATPs that I get, depending on who's doing the counting, okay, you get about 38 ATPs. You get 38 ATP, so you think, well, so this is just basically getting the process started, and that's correct. But you only get those 38 ATPs under one condition, and that's if there's plenty of oxygen. If there's not plenty of oxygen, you're stuck with two ATPs. Okay? So it's important to be able to get as much energy out of glucose as possible if you want to be efficient. If you don't want to be efficient, that's fine. It turns out that's good. Did you know that? Not being efficient is good. Any speculation on when you might not want to be very efficient? Well, when you're running a marathon, you'd kind of like to be efficient, I think. Yeah. Maybe when you're asleep? Maybe when you're asleep? Well, not really. I can think of a better condition. It's a condition I found myself in earlier this term. Uh, well, I was going to say when you're stressed, you don't want to be overloaded. But no, it's not when you're stressed. When you're on a diet. When you're on a diet. Absolutely. You want to be the least efficient when you're on a diet because the more it takes to burn to make ATP, the more stuff you're going to burn up. I'll tell you later about how people have this notion about going aerobic is the best thing that you can do, and I'm going to try to convince you that going anaerobic is the best thing that you can do if you're trying to lose weight. Okay, we'll talk about that in times to come. Let's look at the energy investment phase. The energy investment phase we can roughly think of as about the first five or six reactions of glycolysis. Okay? First five or six reactions of glycolysis. It sort of depends on how we count them. All right. In this phase, we have to use energy from ATP to get the process started. So here's a catabolic process. And we'll see that in several ways, glycolysis is an unusual catabolic process. Here's a catabolic process that is sort of breaking the rules and requiring us to put energy in before we can get energy out. Most catabolic processes don't do that. Okay. There's two different places, as you can see on the screen here, where ATP is used. And in this first phase, no ATP is generated. The ATP is generated only in the second phase, as we shall see. Well, let's take a look at the reactions. Here's the first reaction. Glucose combines with ATP to produce glucose 6-phosphate and ADP. I showed you this reaction earlier. It's catalyzed by the enzyme known as hexokinase. By the way, I'm also going to tell you in a few cases the delta G0 primes for reactions. And I think you should know the generalities, not the absolute numbers. This guy has a fairly negative delta G0 prime. If I tell you about the delta G0 prime for reaction being fairly negative, fairly positive, you should, you should know those. Okay, This is one of them. This reaction has a delta G0 prime that's fairly negative meaning that if we start this reaction with all concentrations of everything equal, that it will go strongly in the forward direction. Okay. Now, I'd like to think about this reaction. What if we were to try to do this reaction with phosphate instead of ATP? The enzyme will actually do it. And if we measure the delta G0 prime for the reaction using phosphate instead of ATP, what we discover is that the delta G0 prime for the reaction is very positive. Well, this is a prime example of where coupling the hydrolysis of ATP to a, an energetically unfavorable reaction converts it into a favorable reaction. A prime example of that. 
Same reaction with phosphate instead of ATP has a delta G0 prime that's very positive, meaning not very favorable in the forward direction. It's going to be much more favorable in the reverse direction. Okay. However, when I link it to ATP and the, the hydrolysis of ATP yields energy that drives this reaction forwards. Okay. This reaction is an interesting reaction. It's one of three reactions in glycolysis that is one of the regulated reactions, meaning the enzyme itself is regulated. Okay. This one turns out to have an unusual regulation, and I'm going to spend very little time talking about that. I won't talk about regulation until at least Wednesday. Okay? But this is one of three. Glycolysis is also unusual in having not one regulatory step, but three steps that are controlled. This is, what's that? In the pathway, in the pathway. Okay. Okay. The second step of, oh, by the way, the induced fit. I've showed you guys this, that before, but you may recall when I talked about glycolysis before and I said that, remember how the substrate changes the enzyme upon binding it? And the example I actually gave you was this enzyme. Hexokinase starts out, it's got two molecules that it's got to bind and it's got to crunch together to transfer that phosphate from one to the other. We can think of these as rather like the jaws, the teeth of the jaws right here, okay? Where up above I could have, let's say, ATP and down below I could have glucose. The binding of both of these causes the jaws to close so that the phosphate of the ATP is brought into close proximity of glucose and the phosphate is able to jump. When that phosphate jumps, the jaws open and the molecules come back out. This is a really good example of an enzyme that has an induced fit. It changes its shape as it binds to its substrate. You can see that here a little bit. They're only showing you the glucose. They're not showing you the ATP. But you can see that the addition of glucose in this case is converting the unbound enzyme to the bound enzyme shown in red. You can literally see those jaws closing down. OK. Reaction two of glycolysis is a reaction catalyzed by phosphoglucoisomerase. OK. And it simply involves the conversion of the 6-carbon glucose, uh, uh, glucose 6-phosphate to fructose 6-phosphate. Okay? We see it goes through a linear intermediate in order to do this. And all that's happening here is an aldehyde group right here is being converted to a ketone group. So the position of the double bonded oxygen is moving in the, in the, in the uh, molecule. That is an isomerization. Phosphoglucoisomerase, or glucose phosphate isomerase, you see it listed both ways. Okay. And reaction number three is a, one of the most important reactions of glycolysis. This reaction, first of all, is catalyzed by the enzyme known as PFK, phospho fructokinase, and yes, you're more than welcome to call it PFK. Later in the term, we'll, you'll see that we refer to this as PFK1, and you can call it either PFK1 or PFK at this point because we haven't encountered PFK1 or 2 yet, but this is PFK. Now, why is this reaction so important? Well, first of all, this reaction, this enzyme, PFK, is the most important regulatory enzyme in the glycolysis pathway. It's the most important regulatory enzyme in the glycolysis pathway. And as we will see, there are several things that can allosterically affect this enzyme. Several things that allosterically affect this enzyme. You'll notice, <coughs> excuse me, also that we're adding a second ATP in this reaction. So we're converting fructose 6-phosphate to fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. And by the way, you may use these abbreviations. There's only one abbreviation I'll ask you not to use, and I'll show you that one later. Okay? But all the abbreviations that they use here are certainly acceptable uh, in this class, with the exception of the one I'll give you later. Okay. ATP is required. And just as we saw before, this reaction with the hydrolysis of ATP, the delta G0 prime for this reaction, is very negative. 
It helps the hydrolysis of ATP, helps to drive this reaction forward. If we try to do this reaction with phosphate instead of ATP, we discover it doesn't go forward very well at all. In fact, it goes very strongly backwards. So the hydrolysis of ATP, again, is making this, pot, making this reaction much more favorable. All right, so at this point, we've built a molecule that has two phosphates into it. And now, in the next step, we're ready to break it apart. Okay? We can look at this next step as being a lyase-type reaction, because what we see is that this guy is going to get split right in the middle. And this enzyme is the only enzyme in the entire pathway whose name doesn't immediately tell you what it does. It's called aldolase. All the other enzyme names in the pathway tell you what the enzyme does. Okay? So what's happening here? In this reaction, fructose 1,6-bisphosphate is being split in half. One half becomes dihydroxyacetone phosphate, or DHAP. The other half becomes glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, or in what your book calls GAP, and I don't like that. Let's call it G3P. G3P, OK? So instead of calling it GAP, you're going to call it G3P. OK, now, this reaction is interesting. This reaction is interesting because the delta G0 prime for this reaction is very positive. It's very positive. Now, if I told you that the delta G0 prime for a reaction is very positive, would that tell you if the reaction goes forwards or backwards? No, it wouldn't tell you anything because the delta G would tell you, right? Delta G0 prime will influence that, but delta G will not tell you, right? Same as with the other reactions. Delta G0 prime, even though it's very negative, it doesn't determine the direction <coughs> only if I tell you that all the concentrations of things I start with are equal. Then it tells me the direction of a reaction, right? Well, how do I have a reaction that has a delta G0 prime that's very positive, yet the reaction still gets to go forward? What would it take to do that? A covalent intermediate? A covalent intermediate, no. A high concentration of the reactant is one thing. And what else would, would, would help this reaction to go forward? Well, the enzyme doesn't change. Remember, the enzymes don't change delta G. Well, that's a good point. So the delta Gs in the first two parts of the reaction do actually help. And they help by increasing the concentration of reactants, which is uh, related to what Connie said. A decrease in concentration of the products. Remember, these reactions, we see that one's connected to the next, connected to the next. So if I have something sucking away the products of this reaction, those two can work together to overcome this energy barrier. Because that's going to change the value of that log term. Increasing concentration of reactant and decreasing concentration of product. Now, as we will see, the cell has a really cool trick for accomplishing both of these things. I'm sorry? Oh. Yep. And that's not the cool trick it uses either. <laughs> Blast you. OK. OK. So we'll come back. We'll talk more about the aldolase reaction uh, in a bit. We turn our attention now to a, the last of the energy investment phase. And the last this energy investment phase involves the conversion of dihydroxyacetone phosphate into glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. Now, notice this is a reversible reaction, so it can go either way. But in the direction of glycolysis, it moves to the right. In the direction of synthesizing glucose, it moves to the left. We'll talk about the synthesis of glucose next week. Okay. So the dihydroxyacetone phosphate was one of the oh, two products of the previous reaction. That's the DHAP. That's the DHAP. So in this reaction, we're converting DHAP into G3P. Now we have two G3Ps. This simplifies things for keeping track of stuff. Because now every reaction is just duplicated. We have two copies of everything that's reacting from this point forward, and the two copies are the same thing. 
This reaction is catalyzed by the enzyme known as triose phosphate isomerase. And it is a prime example of something we talked about earlier in the term. Triose phosphate isomerase is a perfect enzyme. It's a perfect enzyme, meaning that it has a very high kcat over km value. It's limited primarily only by the rate with which the substrate diffuses to the enzyme. And the reason that this enzyme is perfect, it appears, is because there's actually an unstable intermediate that is produced in the mechanism of the enzyme. The faster the reaction goes, the less time that unstable intermediate is around to cause problems. By making the enzyme perfect, we make the reaction go so fast, the unstable intermediate doesn't have a chance to fall apart. So perfect enzymes commonly have that strategy. Well, the upshot of this is at this point, we now have two molecules of glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate and we are ready to move to the oxidation phase of glycolysis. Okay? The oxidation phase. By the way, there's the um, unstable intermediate right there. You don't need to know that, but just to tell you I wasn't lying, you know it's there. Okay. In the energy generation phase, what we see is that there are two places that ATPs are produced. But remember that since every molecule is duplicated, the ATPs themselves are also duplicated. So we're going to produce in this second phase a total of four ATPs. That's how we get our net gain of two. All right. Well, let's start the process off with a bang. And starting that process off with a bang is this mouthful of an enzyme, glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate dehydrogenase. By the way, whenever you see the word dehydrogenase involved in an enzyme name, it's always a redox enzyme. That, of course, is reaffirmed by the fact that there's an NAD plus that is present here. Now, this reaction is actually two reactions that are occurring on this molecule. Remember that we're starting with two of these G3Ps. Everything we've got two of from now on. So we have two G3Ps, we have two NADs, we produce two of these, and we produce two of these, and we produce two of these. All right, now, what's happening in this molecule? Well, the first thing that happens in this molecule is an oxidation. An oxidation is occurring. The NAD is giving us a clue to that, and the structure of this aldehyde is the other clue. Notice we have an aldehyde to start with. Over here, we have an ester. That means this guy had to have gotten oxidized to an acid first. So the oxidation happens, and then after the oxidation happens, phosphate is put onto the acid, making the ester. Okay? So oxidation to produce an acid, then addition of the phosphate to the acid to produce the ester. The oxidation converts NAD into NADH, as you can see here. And this reaction is interesting. If we compare it, for example, to the hexokinase reaction or the PFK reaction, those reactions were putting a phosphate onto something, right? And I told you that putting that phosphate onto something required hydrolysis of ATP. That's why they used ATP. We're putting a phosphate onto something, and we're not using ATP. What does that tell you about this reaction? This reaction is energetically favorable, by the way. What does it tell you? It says we have to have an energy source, right? Previously, we had an energy source from ATP. Now we have to have some other energy source. What do you suppose the energy source is? Well, it, th this molecule has a higher energy, sure, but, but we have to make this molecule. What's that? No, it's not the NAD+. Plus. It's the oxidation reaction. Remember that oxidation produces energy. So this oxidation that's occurring in this, in this process is giving sufficient energy to add that phosphate. 
In the previous reactions we saw, the energy came from ATP. Here the energy is coming from oxidation. So putting together an oxidation, in this case with a phosphate, gives us a high energy intermediate, 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate. This guy's loaded with energy. 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate or 1,3-BPG is one of those molecules in that table I showed you last time that had a higher energy than ATP did. It's got a higher energy than ATP does. This guy is full of energy. That negative charge and that negative charge really repel each other. They really don't want to be together. OK. And the next reaction, well, I'm sorry, this, this is not the next reaction. This is the, the, the mechanism of that reaction. There's the oxidation. There's the phosphate coming on. So you can see the sort of two steps to this process. In the next reaction, we generate our first ATPs. Okay. This enzyme is known as phosphoglycerate kinase. If you want to call it PG kinase, that's fine too. In this reaction, a phosphate from 1,3-BPG is being transferred onto ADP to make ATP, and that leaves us behind with 3-phosphoglycerate. Now, in order for this reaction to go forwards efficiently, and yes, it does, in order for this reaction to go forwards efficiently, this guy's got to have a lot of energy, and it does. 1,3-BPG has more energy than ATP does, so therefore it can transfer the phosphate onto ADP and make ATP very efficiently. This type of a reaction is a type of a reaction that we haven't seen previously. We're actually making ATP using this step. It turns out there are three ways of making ATP. One is what you see on the screen. It's what's known as substrate level phosphorylation. Substrate level phosphorylation. In this mechanism, a high energy molecule is transferring a phosphate to ADP to make ATP. That's only one of three ways that cells make ATP. Okay. The second way that cells make ATP is what's called oxidative phosphorylation. We'll talk about that next term when we talk about the electron transport system. Oxidative phosphorylation in animals is by far the most abundant form of making ATP, the most abundant way of making ATP. The third type, or the third mechanism for making ATP is what's called photophosphorylation, and that's what plants use in photosynthesis. Now this is a relatively minor way of making ATP. Substrate level phosphorylation doesn't contribute very much to the overall ATP pool. Questions? OK, well, we're getting close. We're getting close. The last three reactions you see are all bundled together. We're going to make it through. All right? Actually, we might not make it through. Maybe we won't. Um, Yay. <laughs> I'll just take up the time with something else that you'll be responsible for. So, all right. But I'll spend a little bit of time on this first reaction. This first reaction is kind of cool. All right? I don't know why your book bundles all three of them as if they're not important, because this one turns out to be a really important reaction. Look at what's happening in this reaction. 3-phosphoglycerate is being converted to 2-phosphoglycerate. It looks like it's a simple isomerization reaction. And overall, it is, but you'll notice the enzyme is not, class, is not described as an isomerase. It's described as a mutase. What the heck is a mutase? Well, the mutase tells us something about the mechanism that this uses. So if I had an isomerase, what would an isomerase do? Well, it would grab that phosphate on position number three, and it would move it to position number two, and we would have the same end product. OK? Well, how does a mutase work? A mutase works by making an interesting intermediate. It makes an intermediate by putting an additional phosphate on. So at one place, I have two phosphates on. 
and then it removes this phosphate and leaves the other one behind. Well, maybe you can see where this is headed. The intermediate in this process of a mutase is known as 2,3-BPG. 2,3-BPG is an intermediate, it's a byproduct, and it's a stable byproduct of this reaction. 2,3-BPG, you remember what I said was a byproduct of metabolism. It binds to hemoglobin and favors the release of oxygen. The more glycolysis I have going on, the more likely some of that 2,3-BPG is going to escape from the enzyme, not make this thing, and now go out and affect hemoglobin. The mechanism of this enzyme is actually telling our body, here's where a lot of glycolysis is going on. It's a really cool thing. 2,3-BPG can be released from the enzyme without making this in some cases, and at a low efficiency, let's say 5% efficiency, 2,3-BPG is released and this is not made. The more I have glycolysis going on, the more 2,3-BPG is made, and of course this is the flag that there's, this is a cell that's needing energy very quickly, very rapidly. Okay, so 2,3-BPG is produced in that way. Questions about that? You just look like you've been struck dumb. Oh my God, I have seen the light, right? I have seen it, I know. And just so that you won't feel like I'm rushing you through, why don't we just call it right there for the exam? How's that? Oh, one question over here, yeah. Yep, this, this equilibrium is fairly, delta G zero prime is fairly close to zero. Yep. Okay, see you guys on Wednesday. Exam material stops right here. Names. Some of them had the title in it, some of them didn't. Um, uh -huh. Does it matter which we use? Give me an example. Well, it, just sometimes you called it phospho phospho and acetide, and sometimes you called it phospho. Oh, oh, yeah, that's fine. Either, either's it's fine. Either's fine. Yeah, yeah. Hi. Oops, sorry. You can use the glycolysis at the beginning oh. after the last exam. Is that right? Oh. <laughs> need more time. Hey, Lauren, how you doing? How's it going, Emily? Yes, sir. I have a question. 